let's talk about the big decision. Yeah. Because you're obviously an entrepreneur at heart. Yes. You got that gambler's mentality. Yes. So you've got crush, you got the seed money, everything's forming. Like once again, here's why your story is fascinating because a lot of people have been like, I'm going to do this until uh, till I'm done. Like yeah. a lot of people would try to run that for the next 30 years of their life and then sell it to somebody and call it a day. Yes. But then you get this opportunity to work in LA and to work with Rob and a company that's got a lot of traction. How do you make a big decision like that? Like when life gives you yeah. too much good stuff, oh, humble brag, everything's going right for Paul. <laughs> do you do you take a walk? Do you talk to the wife? Do you write out the pros and cons on paper like we've seen in sitcoms? Like yeah. what the fuck did you do, Paul? Yeah, so back then uh, I didn't have the support system I have now, right? So these days I've got a group of mentors that really helped me through these difficult decisions, including my wife and, and, and some family members. I had a couple of people I was able to lean on back then. And, you know, one of the, the people I was able to lean on is Keith, who, you know, Keith worked for me, right? And ultimately my leaving crush could put his existence at risk as well, 100%. too. 100%. Right? And it was, and Keith was like a brother to me as well, too. So it was a really difficult decision. It created a lot of friction between myself and my partners at Crush. What's interesting about the move as well, too, I had helped develop a couple of businesses inside of Crush where there was uh, equity that was kept inside of Crush, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And when I left to run Rob's company, I knew that at some point that equity could become real valuable. And at yeah. some point, it could cost me a shit ton of money, yeah. right? That's not what it's about for me, man. Like my, my gut, my energy, those that were really close to me, like really got me, uh, they supported me making the decision. And not only that, there were people inside of Deerdick that I knew when I got there, they were going to help me kind of support. They were going to help me support leading the business with Rob as well too, right? And you know, look, with all of these decisions, there's collateral damage, right? right. There is, man. And you know, through those decisions over the years, there are some people you find out weren't as close with you as what you thought, but then there's other people that you find out like, holy shit, man, this this guy really has my back, right? And and, and as I get into, you know, as I head into my late, I'm wrapping up my late 40s, um, it's interesting to look back 25 years and kind of see, and for me, I'm not like, ah, shit, this dude's a dick, right? Like this yeah. guy, I'm, I am more about appreciating those that have supported me along the way than like putting that negative energy out there towards those that maybe didn't handle situations the way I would have hoped. And the truth is too, man, I, I have mishandled many decisions myself along the way. So who am I to judge? Well, I find that as you get older, life gets a little bit easier because you have less testosterone. Straight up. And I have, so docu I have documented enough men in their 40s to know in your 40s, you mellow the fuck out. Yeah. You normally make a, a major life pivot. And, you know, there used to be the midlife crisis, which was the secretary or the Corvette. <laughs> now it's a new career. Straight you know, up. now the midlife crisis is like, I've been killing myself working on building this vision of me. And now that I'm not so angry against the world, what is this new vision of me? Like, what's not working here? Yeah. How can I make a major life pivot? And it's not that I live my life trying to, like, you know, burn those that burn me, but I try to elevate those that have helped me. Straight and, up. and I think that's a different mindset that, that you learn as you, as you go along. We're just very, very selective, right? Yeah. And I, yeah. I just go back to, you know, thinking about, like, okay, I've got to make people come to me. What can I do, right? Like, have I turned over every rock to make people come to me? Yeah. Right? And that's really, that's like how I feel like it's got to be done these days, right? And I think, it's, and, and look, here's the thing too, right? I've got like 500 Instagram followers. I've got like 2,000 LinkedIn followers. Like, I don't have a big social media platform. Sure. I, I literally- I follow just, you on Instagram though. And I, I've only been on it for like six months, right? Yeah. So- my entire life I've kind of stayed away from as a big, like I've got to grow up, right? I've got to be like more, more communicative with people over social. 
when you look at like my network, right? And I'm going to tell everybody under the sun, this is my first podcast. I'm so excited, right? And like inside of my network, there's other influencers, there's brands, there's media company executives. You never know when like the those chips, one of those chips is just falling into place, right? And look, when I think about your relationships and your network and the people you know, every day you're in the game, right? Like you're, and think about how hard it was just to even be in the game, yeah. right? And now it's like, okay, yeah, my network is pretty unbelievable. I have that. I know I kick ass at creating content. People love to speak with me. So yeah, what are the what are the engineering adjustments I can make to my business to make sure I am noticed with people that can help me? And man, if, if that if I'm if I'm being too vague here, feel free to call me out on it. No, I'm- no, because you're 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 preaching to the choir because I pivoted with the podcast to make it, you know, I went from adventures in design to AID network. Yep. I didn't want to leave it all behind, but I wanted to package it differently because when you write somebody and they see the word design, they go, but I'm not an artist. But fuck that because we've all designed a happiness into our life. I got something for you. I'm sorry. I'm excited and I'm inspired. Give it to me, buddy. So you kick ass at this shit, right? Is there not an opportunity? You know, maybe there is somebody out there who's got like a platform of influence, right? That comes from the right place, right? Do you not have the ability to actually create this ecosystem where people that have real influence, you're kind of coaching them? So Reese Witherspoon, right? As an example. Teach her how to podcast? Yeah, like, like you have... You're a fucking pioneer at this shit, man, right? Like, it's, yeah. you, you were there first, right? So is there a part of your business where it's like, okay, I've got my network, right? I'm going to, you know, continue to do my thing. But is there an opportunity for me to also, like, help people get going inside of podcasting? I believe there is because the new website and the app reflects. So the last 200, 300 episodes. Yep. People show up Monday through Friday. Oh, Monday's a comment below where we talk about pop culture. Tuesday's one of our reoccurring theme shows. Wednesday's uh, the poster countdown or the logo show where we talk about branding in a fun way. Or it's Friday, it's hammer time. Or it's one of my interviews like today. Yep. Well, when the website and the app comes out, you start to see AID look like Netflix. Yeah. If you click on one of those buttons, you go, oh, wow, I guess I didn't realize there's 45 of these or there's 50 of these. Yeah. So my idea is that when that stuff goes public facing, that people will be able to see, not only is he the curator and the the, the voice on the, the, the podcast, but this is a guy who's been able to take his own channel his own connectivity with his audience yeah and make it look like a network and diversify it where i turned my wife into a podcast like all of these relationships in my life i'm exploiting as content when i find somebody that i have a genuine bond with like my camera from violent gentlemen i go we're going to start a podcast for guys called hammer time yeah because in this environment you need to be socially responsible but guys still want to be able to hang out and be guys and bust balls of course we need to create that safe space as weird as that sounds now of course but i do feel like that once that switches then the next play is this is who i am this is what i've accomplished maybe i can help you do something similar or maybe i can produce something with you yeah and yeah and here here's like an even another thought to that let's say it's you know it's a young woman who has zero overlap with your audience or your network right right is there an opportunity to kind of be a private label solution for her right where you're helping her power up her network and you're bringing all of your front end experience and your back end capability now she's got her own network and you're getting like some kind of like revenue overriding that i i also feel Woo, we're cooking we got it and let's go here's Sorry. here's the insane thing to people at home paul so paul and i had an agreement that i would interview him and at the end of the conversation we would pivot around and we would showcase his talent by focusing it over on me as the subject matter every bit of advice paul's just given me was sent to me in an email from johnny cupcakes on a flight and he was like i was thinking about you this is the full potential of your brand and everything you've just said, Paul, Johnny wrote out into an email. And so I've been taking my ships in the water yeah. and pointing them in this direction. And I feel like a real opportunity for someone like myself, and we'll use Vans as an example because we've been talking about them, 
companies have fan bases. Like I made a diagram at home at all things that build audience. And one of those things I put in there was brands because brands have dedicated fans. Look at Vans, look at Disney. You know, you'll see people that are motivated by these brands. I think I have the beat on how brands to tell their story where it's not advertising. Like Vans could seriously create a podcast that they never even have to tell you how to buy the shoes, but they can sell you on their legacy. They can sell you on their story, which in turn sells you on the product and makes you want to go buy Vans because you've hung out with them, you've been submerged in the company, and now you want to buy it more. Absolutely. And even to that point, man, even the story of Vans coming up with the idea to build a skateboarding league, like having been in the weeds with those guys since it was a concept, these guys are building a professional sports league while being one of the hottest youth culture footwear brands on the planet, right? Like, it's, it's a crazy story in its own right. No, no, and by the way, right, my, this is the shit I live for. Like, I, I love, I mean, I was excited to do the podcast, but even like helping someone like yourself just talking through how you can ratchet up your business I live for that shit, man. It's what you do. I mean, you're a mentor. You've been a builder of brands. You've been a builder of businesses. And I was excited to have this conversation because I thought that there was a way to actually, for once in the show, because like, you know, I've done 815 episodes. Yeah. I'm always trying to find a way when I bring somebody on, what's different about this person? Yeah. And I thought with you and sort of the connectivity we have, but also being strangers, that it'd be a really great thing. I'm like, I'm going to show the audience a guy do his thing yeah. in real time. Yeah. Like, here's a bunch of shit on the table. <laughs> sort it out for me and let's see what you can come up with. Yeah. 